company or your bank, right? Uh, bank and project manager. Yes, so he does what we all do, right? Yeah. He just been doing it longer. I think he started investing when he was wee high. Um, because if you go out there, there's other Luther Wilsons in the city, and Luther Wilson II um, is uh, his predecessor. So I think he's been learning this since he was born. And then we have Tanner Badgley. Um, you find Luther, follow him on Facebook. He has lots of great information. Tanner Badgley is on Facebook a little bit, but his big thing I see him mostly is on Instagram. That's where I see him a lot. He has a ton of great information. Him and his team started out, I'm going to let them tell their whole stories, but he and his team started out wholesaling, um, but I believe they bought almost 20 houses in the last five months. They didn't go to a bank. They got them creatively, and then they're selling them creatively and making them cash flow. So I'm going to welcome first Luther, and he gets half the evening, and then we'll switch over and let Tanner have the other half. I understand no no PowerPoints for everybody? No, no PowerPoint. Can you All hear right. me? Mic check? Mic check. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. All right, uh, Luther, let's give him a round of applause. All right, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. I uh, appreciate y'all being here. I'm excited. So uh, one of my goals tonight is to educate, inspire, and collaborate. All right, so we'll bring it through inspiration through education and some collaboration. So I'll uh, start off giving a little background about me uh, growing up, how I got into real estate, and then some of my trajectory, trajectory, some of the deals that I've done recently, and then also just kind of breaking down some of the mechanics of a seller finance deal. So as Kim mentioned, I grew up in the real estate business. Both my parents are here. Uh, my mom's been a realtor 29 years. Going on 30 years, my pops have been investing 31 years. So since I was age five, um, seeing how they got into the business was was very impressive. And so growing up, just talking about real estate investments was a regular conversation. And so I think my initial introduction into installment agreements was my either my last year of high school or my first year of college. So I, I borrowed some money from my dad, and uh, next thing I knew, I, I, I had a note with a payment plan on, on it, and little did I know that was kind of my introduction into a note. And so growing up, I was an athlete. I did three sports in high school, a couple years of football, three years of basketball, and four years of track. And then track and field took me off to Wichita State, got a scholarship there. And I spent five years there. So as soon as I got there, I got into real estate classes, entrepreneurship classes. I like knew in the back of my head that I was going to do real estate someday. Just didn't know exactly how or when or to what degree. And so after college, actually, I, I purchased my first investment from my dad in 2008. It was a note on a second mortgage on a little house in KCK. I picked it up for 1600 bucks, and it paid me back over $3,000 over the course of about two years. So that was my first investment. Um, the first time I bought a house was in 2009. I bought it subject to the existing financing from my dad and uh, picked up on the payments, deeded it over to me. And around that time, uh, the government was paying people to purchase homes. So I was, I was a first time home buyer and I got the first time home buyer tax credit of $8,000. So that was probably my most interesting deal. One of my most interesting it was the first house I ever bought. It was a subject to, I got paid eight grand from the government to buy it, and I did a house hack because the two years that I lived there, I had a girlfriend stay with me, my brother stayed with me for a little bit, and I had two different roommates stay with me for a little bit too. So um, that actually, hack mean? say what? What does house hack mean? House hack, I think is a way for an owner occupant buyer to get into a home and they can do it on a single family home, on a duplex, on a quadplex, and they basically are in the home living in the property or the house, and they're written out the rooms, or they are written out the other units, my understanding. Um, uh, no, yeah, she mowed the lawn and she, she shoveled it. She shoveled snow. <laughs> so that very first house that I bought in 2009, I stayed there for a couple years, 
And that actually led to my first seller finance deal, which was a contract for deed that we did in 2011. And I think we got $3,000 down and ended up getting a little over a thousand a month. All right, so that was 2011. Fast forward to 2021, that same purchaser refinanced and paid us off. And that was a nice check of about $48,000. I spent that with my dad. So that's kind of a cool example of, you know, being able to buy and hold and you're waiting, you know, you pay down the debt and you get the appreciation and depreciation and so forth. So, um, let's see. Okay, so 2009, I did that first seller finance deal. 2011, I got into wholesaling. I did that for a couple of years, didn't really like it, um, and kind of struggled with it at the time. So did that for a couple of years, went back to work, was waiting tables, was training people. I was an athlete in college, and so just being fit was part of who I am. So I was a personal trainer, I was waiting tables, and then I ended up getting licensed as a realtor in 2014. And I started off as a leasing agent, and I worked for a property management company here in town. At the time, they were managing about 300 houses, mostly in the inner city, urban core, independence, KCMO, that sort of thing. So during that first year, I leased about 50 to 60 houses. And that kind of got me into the property management world. And then from there, I worked for another property management company for about six months. Did the same, same kind of thing, a mixture of leasing, then they paid me part time as a property manager, got into the sales side of the business as a realtor, and then from there, ended up going into sales full time as a realtor for another company. And all along the way, I tried to invest and try to figure out how to not only find deals, but how to structure the creative finance deals, but also a little bit of you know raising private capital and, and trying to figure out the partnership game as well. And so that kind of led to just me bouncing around and getting my broker's licenses and doing a number of deals. And it really wasn't until 2019 that things really started to click. And um, it was 2019, I had switched companies, I had started a few different businesses, had some partnerships that didn't work out, fell on my face, got back up, started over again. And in 2019 was when I partnered with a gentleman from Canada and he had a little bit of money and we just we hit the ground running. So we did, since then we've been doing some wholesaling, some buy and hold, a little bit of wholesale as well. And we've been able to use the strategic, we've been able to use the contract for these as an exit strategy. And so over the last three years, me and that partner purchased 13 houses. We sold off seven and the other six, we are in the process, well, I'd say, let's see, four or five of them are going now in contract for these. And the other one of them were remodeling and the other one were refinancing. So um, I've been able to do seller financing not only for my own investments with my partners, but also for clients that I pick up as a real estate broker. So over the last three years, including my own deals and the deals that I've done with some uh, some of my clients, I'd say there's a total of 17 seller finance deals that we've completed over the last three years. And of those 17, our average down payment is about $27,000. So for those that are buying and holding, so those that are fixing and flipping, there's definitely a unique opportunity. And I think now more so than ever, at least over the last 10 years, I'd say. So, how, okay, let's kind of, I kind of want to gauge the audience. How many here right now are doing long-term rentals, whether it's single family or multi-family? All right. How many of you are doing fix and flip? Okay. How would you like to get the most of that, most best of both worlds, <laughs> fixing and flipping, as well as buying and holding? How does that sound? All right. It sounds pretty good, right? Well, I think you have an opportunity. So, what we've been doing the last three years is we've been mixing the Burr strategy with seller financing. So we've been able to buy the property using a combination of hard money as well as private money to cover the purchase and the rehab. After the rehab, then we refinance. And then from there, we get the good long-term debt. 
we always shoot for 30 year fixed notes on our on our refis. If it makes sense and we can do the cash out refis, by all means. If the spreads aren't there, we're a little bit over budget, it might be all in at 80, 85% of the ARV, it's going to be a rate and term refi. And then from there, we'll do the contract for deed wrap. You with me? Mm -hmm. All right, so as far as, let's see, I want to go through one case study. Um, and if you follow me on Instagram or on Facebook or LinkedIn, I try to give all the game away. I, I just break down step by step how we how we went through the process, a little bit of how we found the deal, and then the numbers on the back end, because I think that's what most of us are intrigued by. So I did a deal with a client. They purchased it last year in the spring. It was a three-bed, two-bad house, an independent 6405 up. All right. So we got it off market. We were direct to sell it. And it was actually a fix and flipper here in town who purchased it from another wholesaler, started the project and realized like, hey, you know, maybe we can still exit. They, you know, they weren't sure if they were gonna, you know, continue with their partnership. So they decided to sell it to, to my client. So they had already bought it, closed on it, title clean, all that. They had already cleaned out the property and did some of the prep work, all right? So my client bought it for 135. We rehabbed it. My rehab team rehabbed it for 50,000. All right, they used hard money, so they had six to 12 months to complete the purchase, complete the rehab and the resell, the rehab and the refi. So I think their all in costs on that were close to 190. All right, from there, they refinanced the property appraised for 235. All right, so they got a 30 year fix at 7% interest. All right, um, then from there, we were able to do a contract for deed wrap, get appraised for 235, right? We sold it, seller finance, and the contract for deed for two fifty five. We got forty thousand dollars down, and payments are just over seventeen hundred a month. So on that deal, they have some money left in the deal, all right. But they're cash flowing a good three to four hundred bucks a month, and with the seller financing, there's virtually no expenses, all right. So when you're doing your math and you're comparing your buying bull to your fix and flip, or whatever your exit strategy is. You ought to start looking at seller financing as a, as a neat way to exit because when you're doing your pro formas, I don't know, whatever calculator you're using, bigger pockets, if you're using a spreadsheet, whatever it is, you can go ahead and put a zero in the rower column for expenses. You can, you can put a zero for maintenance, right? You can put basically a zero for the taxes and the insurance too because you're still on title and even though you're paying those out of your pocket, they'll get offset by your purchaser's escrow on the monthly payment as well. So it's kind of the best, world, both, best of both worlds again, because you get the large down payment and you get cash flow each month. So um, I want to break down the documents that we use for a contract for deeds, all right? Because I think that's something that doesn't really dis get discussed a whole, a whole lot. And I think it's very important. A lot of people emphasize using seller financing or subject to purchases as an acquisition strategy, which I think is beautiful and by all means if you can, but I think not enough investors are looking at creative financing as an exit strategy. And so as far as the contract for Dean goes, there's usually seven or eight documents that we use and you don't have to, like, I'll give you my information once, once we're done. Come find me, I'll give you a card. You can get my social media. I'll send you all this information. All right, if you want to meet one on one or in a group, I'll be happy to share this with you. Because I'm going to go through it pretty fast. All right, the first document is a contract for deed. The second is a financing disclosure. The third is an as is condition form. The fourth is a lead based paint disclosure. The fifth is the affidavit of equitable interest, which Kim mentioned earlier. The sixth is the quick claim deed. The seventh is the warranty deed, and the eighth is the amortization schedule. So it breaks it all down very, very detailed. It, it discloses your, you know, it discloses the purchaser's interest in the property. It discloses whether you as the seller or property owner have underlying debt. We usually structure these with no prepayment penalty and no balloon. So it's 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 super attractive. 
30 year fix, usually 20 to 30 year fix. And that's how we're able to get such large down payments, all right? So uh, keep that in mind. Um, let's see. One thing that I really like about seller finance deals is it really can create more opportunities for home ownership in our communities. And I think it, well, I know, and I do believe that it will continue to be this way, it creates an opportunity for wealth for the sellers as well. Um, a lot of times, most of us get into real estate for what, right? We, we get into it either for passive income or massive income. And we get carried away in the day-to-day -day and the grind and finding the deal and doing the rehabs and finding the property managers and going through that process. And we forget sometimes why we even got into the business. So I think when you're looking at real estate in general, the grand scheme of things, it's really what most people want is the passive income that's coming in each month. It's not earned income. You don't have to go to work for it, all right? If you build that up enough, especially with seller financing, you don't need that many. Like I got nine houses right now, and it's I, I definitely want a bunch more, but with the seller financing and no expenses, it's, it's so much easier to manage. The cash on cash returns are way higher, and your cash flow is better, all right? So take it from a property manager that's been doing property management one form or another, another for the last eight years, all right? I've worked for four different property, comp, property management companies, two of which I own and ran, all right? I've done the leasing, done the sales, done the management, done the maintenance coordination. It's a pain in the ass, so why not do something <laughs> Seriously. I just did my owner reports yesterday for the four clients who I'm managing rentals for, all right? A third to half of their gross revenue is going towards expenses, and it's more towards 50%, all right? So the money's coming in. Don't get me wrong, there's pros and cons to having rentals, but I think there's, again, you got to open your mind and start looking at getting creative because, again, it's, it's truly more passive. With the rentals, being a property manager, being a landlord, it's not much passive about that, all right? Let's face it, nobody wants to deal with that. It's, you know what I'm saying? The renovations are tough, the management's tough. I talk to investors every single day about landlording, about rentals, and about seller financing now. I spoke to a guy today, and he's tired. He's, he's on his third or fourth property management company. He's got houses in the city. He's having a hard time selling them. He's having a hard time just, there's just so many headaches with it. So I'm saying explore the seller financing, all right? Um, let's see. Overall, uh, as far as the investment strategy, I don't know if it gets much better. Um, we're at a point now where we're starting to attract and utilize more private capital because it's working, all right? And the cool thing about it, even though the market's been pretty hot the last few years and it's harder to find those deep discount deals, you can still be a little bit more aggressive if you're doing seller financing as an exit strategy. Everybody wants to be all in on the purchase of rehab at 70% of ARV, right? Whatever asset class it is, single family, multi-family, commercial, most investors want that. But the fact of the matter is it's hard to find, right? You can, you can put the campaigns together, you can do the marketing, you can find the deal, but how much time and energy went into that, right? If you have access to the capital, if you're planning on buying and holding or flipping anyway, why not explore this? So I think it's truly the best of both worlds. Um, that's all I got for now, so hit me up. Uh, I'm pretty active on Facebook, as Kim mentioned, uh, forward slash Luther935. I'm on LinkedIn, LW Realty 3. I'm on Instagram, Luther 3 RE as well. So we can break it all down for you and we help facilitate transactions too. So if you got a deal in the pipeline and you're wondering how to structure it, you have questions about the documents and you just need to get the documents done and closed, hit us up. We can help you through that process. Well, don't leave it. We might have some oh. questions. Okay. Give it some clothes, love it.
But we want to, you said that seller financing and rentals are not a lot of work, right? Not a lot of work. But we want to make sure we understand that there is a lot of work going into finding the house. So what work goes into putting a seller finance transaction together? Just on the, on the back end. I mean, because once you got it going, is fine, but you got to get it there first. So, I mean, how much time does your, do you or your investor have in finding the deal, rehabbing the house, finding the right person, and then managing the deal afterwards? Four to ten months has been my average, like, for the range, four to ten months. Okay. So, four to ten months, and then uh, rentals. You also you mentioned that on your rental properties that you're getting say 50% uh, of the rental income is going to expenses, but are there other fees that are coming out of that rental income that they need to have? Um, like for taxes. maintenance or it's in there. taxes? It's in there. Well, if you're renting, if you're managing a rental. Well, that's prior to even making the mortgage payment, so that doesn't include the, the taxes or insurance. Half, yeah. half of the gross revenue on a rental, on average, over the course of time, is going out to expenses before you even make the mortgage payment. Before you make the mortgage payment. Right. And then if you have a mortgage so, payment, that's the other half. And you use the basic. <laughs> right. So that's why when you're doing your seller finance, if the window breaks, that's not on you. If the plumbing breaks, that's not on you because the buyer is the owner of the home and you're looking Yes. Right. I met with one of my contract for deed buyers today. He's been my best buyer. It's a house in KCML 99th Street, 64134. It's been there for going on six years, all right? He um, he called me yesterday, said he was paying late. He was gonna drop it in the mail. I said, I'll just drive across town, tell me where you are. He's a contractor, so he's, he's in the trades. And on the phone call yesterday, he said that there was an issue with the plumbing line, and it, in fact, it had collapsed. And he, he, he had told me about it before, a couple of weeks ago, and I said, all right, well, do you have it squared away? Do you need a plumber? And I sent him some information. Our go-to plumbing company is Snake and Root. All right, so I said, hey, it's a great company. Here you go. And I kind of left it at that, because he knows it's on him, right? And so I can, I can help him through the process. When I met with him today, I even, subtly hinted at being able to cover the cost of it and then just him paying us back over time if need be. So, you know, with us being the bank and being here on the ground, there's a lot of flexibility. I like I love working with my buyers, right? So if, if something happens and they get behind or if there's repairs that they can't take up take care of immediately out of pocket, I'm gonna work with them somehow. Right. Get Bank of America to say, here's $8,000 to put a new sewer line in. You can pay me back later. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or $14,000. You got to call for, for $5,500 from Anthony. All right. Cool. Bad, so. so now those are my questions. Do we have any other questions in the room? Up front. Yeah, so what is the, what is the main, um, for you, what have you found is the main uh, oh, the main motivation is for a buyer for you for the seller finance um, in terms of the pluses for them. So our buyers are usually either not willing to get traditional bank financing for a mortgage or they're not able to for whatever reasons. So. And so you just let them know that are you doing are you doing a lease to own or are they just a perpetual renter? It's a contract for the buyer. So they oh. have they have an equitable interest, an equitable ownership interest in the property. And you know Do they have a set amount of time? Thirty years. Okay. And twenty, 20 to thirty years. Thirty years to get yeah. okay. there's, there's no prepayment penalty, there's no balloon. We have an amortization schedule that we print off as part of the package, the documents that we use, it breaks it down every single month. They know how much is going toward principal, how much is going toward interest, and then they have a separate payment for the taxes, which is escrow. What's your longest held property like that right now? How long do you? Um, the one that I mentioned earlier, it's going on six years. Six years. Yeah. So they, they realize that they have 24 more years before they can get the deed from you. They can resell, they can re 
65. I'm not opposed to bidding the property over to them um, because it might be easier to sell or exit it at that point if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of leave it open for them. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they say, hey, we want out of the property because we're going to do X, Y, Z, we're going to refi or whatever the case may be, I would say, all right, well, let's, let's explore that and see if we can make it happen. I might want, you know, a few thousand dollars and something extra for it. And where are you, the metal experts, where have you sourced most of your buyers? Are you, so, I'm thinking question. customized is like, let me find some people that are looking for houses yeah. and then find the houses. But is that what you're doing? Are you find so, houses and look for buyers? I've worked with, over the last three years, I think I've worked with four different agents who are realtors, they're licensed agents, and they're tapped in with certain markets that they have a slew of buyers at any given time. Okay. English is their second I language. And then they'll just say, yeah. I got a buyer for me. Absolutely. So I, I put the package together, very simple. I get professional photos, and I come up with the price of the terms first, and then we get the lot box. So for my clients who I've helped through this process, that's all we need. So I collaborate with them, figure out purchase price, down payment, interest rate, term, figure out what the yearly taxes are, figure out what their yearly insurance is, and I can put that in an email. If I wanted to make it pretty in a Word doc or a PDF, I could do that as well along with the professional photos, and I send it out to my go-to agent first, because she's, she's a killer, she's, she's, she's pretty aggressive and can get it done. If she can't get it done, then there's a few other agents that we can send it out to as well. And we, on occasion, we might use social media to, to, to blast it as well. But that's how we set it up, and we knock it out of the park. You don't put anything on MLS, or have you, do you list it at all? Off market, all, off market. Okay. all off market. I was just going to ask, how do you ascertain what interest rate you're charging them? Usually a point above what is the underlying mortgage, at least a point or two. So lately it's been kind of funky the last couple of years. And so in order to still make it attractive to that end buyer, we're not squeezing them too much. You know, I've refied five houses over the last couple of years and the rates went from 5.25 and I'm doing one this week at 6.7. And so I've had clients go with get refinanced as high as 7.5 and 7.75. On those, we end up just doing a smaller, you know, arbitrage. We might go 7.8, 7.9. And we can we can tweak the numbers. Like it's I, I kind of nerd out on that stuff when there's an opportunity, because I'm like, all right. If we do a higher purchase price and a longer term, you know, we can drop the interest rate to get the monthly payment EITI to what, you know, what would the, you know, normally be the rent amount, basically. That's kind of the, the bar there is making the monthly structure so that the monthly payment is close to what market rent would be for that type of property. And that becomes a condition and location, size, of course, age, and all that. And so that helps with affordability and so forth. Yeah. Hey, Jose. What's up, hey, man? How you doing, man? Yeah. <laughs> so, do you service your own mortgage or do you use a for, service? For now, I'm servicing my own. Um, now that I'm starting to accumulate more, I'm, I'm going to pass it off. And we're looked at. One company that charges an onboarding fee of like 150 bucks, and I think each month per payment is 55 bucks a month. And so for me, like, I'm, I'm all about that. I'm all about outsourcing stuff. So. Like the 150 dollars onboarding yeah. per, per, it just per time. time. Uh, that's one time the 150, and then 55 bucks per month, and they'll send a statement each month and they'll send a statement at the end of the year for the 1090 day, which frees up probably however many hours of my year. I'm looking at time, you know, a lot different now because I'm aging. 
<laughs> Along with this question, I just have a question. Why not traditional mortgage rather than uh, contract for deed? Um, I kind of like being in control and having the deed. I'm not opposed to a true seller carry back. If a purchaser wanted the deed, I would probably switch up some of the terms, maybe the price a little bit. Um, I would want more down payment, that's for sure. And I wouldn't mind getting the property to them on my own. I just haven't had anybody ask. I have had one person ask on a client of mine <coughs> on their property, and we got it done just a few months ago. So. Can you talk to Brian and I about servicing? Because I, I think I think you're paying too much. I haven't started it yet, but I will. Yes, we've been looking around. I think my prices are a little low. Who's, but who's your services? MCI is thirty-five. Yeah, MCI. MCI. Okay. okay. I, I work with a couple others. So. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll holler at you. Any quick so, question before you turn for the group here? Have you dealt with any default situations where you had to take back a property? Yeah, I, I did. I had uh, I had three defaults on the same house. Uh, I think it was three. What is that? No. The house that I mentioned earlier, 99th Street. The body that's in there now is going on their sixth year. But before that, we had three defaults. Um, one of them, the lady's spouse died. Uh, one of them, it was uh, same sex married couple, they split up, and the, the, the lady that was left in the house couldn't keep up with the payments. And so we, I'm pretty good at dealing with the faults up to this point. I've been pretty lucky because I just, I'm pretty easy to get along with. And I, and I kind of, I'm really patient with them, especially knowing that we're getting 10 or 20% down. Like if somebody gets behind, I'm not sweating. I'm saying if somebody gives us eight thousand dollars down, ten thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars down, and they're late for anything, I can care less. So I, I'm going to reach out to them, make sure that they're okay. If I can't, if I don't talk to them, right, I'm going to go by the property to see if they didn't up and leave, right. If they're still in the property and I do hear from them, I'm going to say, hey, what's going on? Like, are you good? Are you going to be able to get back on track? What's the deal? COVID happened, all right, you're not working. What's the plan going forward, all right? Before I make any rash decisions, I'm gonna communicate with them, make sure that they're good. That's the first step. If they can't make it, if they can't get back on track or they get further behind, I'm just gonna ask them to leave their house. You know what I'm saying, right? It's really simple. They know that they're new, they know that they messed up, right? I don't necessarily need to go to the attorney and file eviction immediately. They know they're in default, right? They saw the documents. We got it through the process. So that's the next step. If they're still in the home and they're getting them behind, I'm gonna ask them to leave, right? I'm usually pretty good about talking some sense into people. Once they understand the repercussions of simply just filing an eviction, that's another reason we like to keep the deed, right? Is for the default process, we can do an eviction as opposed to a foreclosure, at least on the initial part, all right? Then from there, if they, if they, uh, if they fight it, I haven't put down that process. So there's steps that I say, right? Communicate with them, ask them to leave, cash for keys, then the judicial process, the eviction and so forth. That's the steps that I take, I've, I've been fine you know, knock on wood, the last, you know, you 12 the years. Exactly. Yeah, but that's just it. If they don't challenge you, that all works good and well. If they challenge yeah. you, they have an equitable interest and it's a judicial I'm up So you are in Chapter 60 court, you're not in a judicial court. I'm up for the fight. I'm a real estate I just want to caution people here I'm because that's, guy. that's the risk you have. I'll take a court a couple of times. I've been in court a couple of times. 
you know, I'm playing a dog one in the gym. <laughs> or you can do it like I did. I had a house that I bought on sub, uh, bought short sale, and I at least owned it to the nice lady that had been in foreclosure. You're not supposed to do that, but I did. And because she made more money than I did, I figured she could buy her house back from me in a few years, and then she couldn't pay her rent. But after she paid me rent for five years, I decided she I made enough money. I just gave her the house back. Okay. Yeah. There's it's creative stuff, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. All right. I do believe we have a question over here. Okay. So why can't people get financing? What are some reasons why people don't want to go to the bank or they can't go to the bank? Um, some people don't trust banks. Some of them may not uh, be able to for whatever reason. They're... Like my borrower that was deceased according to the uh, credit bureau. Uh, that's yeah. what the, one of the first seller finances we did yeah. was... He was dead, and he couldn't kill me. If they're a foreign citizen, you know, maybe they don't have social security or not ten yet, they could be part of it. This just circles back to why you should own or find asset with a, with a deed of trust in, in Missouri, because you can send your notice out, tell them to cure, send your demand letter out, 30 days, they don't cure, 22 days later, you want to call. Okay. I'm gearing up for it. The more I get, the more opportunities I'm sure I'll have to work through situations like that. So I've been pretty fortunate so far. Yes. That's why we're doing this education now so people can make the choice. Absolutely. All right. We're almost to Luther's time. Any more questions? I see it. Bobby. Oh, there we go. Bobby's over here. I can't see you behind Gene's head. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned coming back for Dean quite a bit and talking about some of my business. So for everyone in the room, if you could clarify the difference and if you're talking about them as being one and the same. Okay, so the difference between the contract for deed and the true seller financing is with the true seller financing, the seller or owner of a property would deed the property over to the purchaser at the closing, at the initial closing. And so title transfers, deed would go from, you know, in our case, the investor to the owner finance environment. And it's, there's a different set of docs. You got a, in Missouri, you got a promissory note, deed of trust, in Kansas, it's a note and a mortgage. Um, and then the additional supplements from there, along with the deed, of course. But so. you, can, you can do the, you do the interest rate and the terms and the amortization exactly the same between the two of them. Yeah. 